go ahead and resume. And B is the fact that humans are really inefficient. So what we're gonna find is literally just breaking down calories for energy. Uh, the text, actually, it's funny, in the text it says at one point, 60% of your energy is released as heat. In another section of it, it says about 75% of your energy is released as heat. The key is we as humans are really inefficient. Most of the energy that we're releasing from the food we're breaking down is not actually doing work. Instead, it's literally just being released as heat. And hence why when you start exercising, you warm up. Your metabolic rate increases, and that's when you're going to have to start sweating, depending on how warm the room you're in happens to be. Now, you can literally measure this heat release. Now, this can be done through a calorimeter, and the example here would be an indirect calorimeter where you're exercising in a room, because I guess we're taking some poor gal and locking her inside of a room with a uh, treadmill and having her run to nowhere staring at a wall. Fun fact, guys, the original uh, purpose of the treadmill was literally punishment. It was a, if you were in prison in England, I think it was in the, um, I think it's probably like around the Enlightenment, past the Renaissance, where literally you would walk on a treadmill and by moving the, the mill, you would literally help grind grain. It was a punishment. And now people pay good money to drive to a place to go inside of it to then go walk to nowhere. Hence why if you're ever on a treadmill, you're like, this is stupid and I hate it. It's like, yeah, because it literally is punishment. And what can occur as we're going through and being inside of these rooms is we can literally figure out how much heat we're releasing to the environment. Now, you can actually have certain suits that are gonna do this, and we're going to find that you can obviously have entire rooms that can be donated to this. Now, we are typically going to do what's known as indirect calorimetry, which is we're going to look at how much oxygen we're taking in and how much carbon dioxide we're giving out. And the ratios of the two is gonna let us know what fuels we're using. And then a ballpark idea of how many calories we're using. And that's what metabolic cart next door is all about doing. Now, these are going to be pretty accurate, but they're slow. And then the newer ones where you can even look at resting metabolic rates so of literally just laying down with it attached to you and figuring out what's going on are going to be pretty accurate, but still gonna be kind of expensive. You can even use doubly labeled water. There's a lot of different options you have, but really all we're trying to do here guys is measure how many calories we're using. Because most exercise is simply going to be an energy production problem. And that energy production problem, is just a math problem that we talked about in biomechanics where we're talking about doing a certain amount of work in joules or obviously having a certain power output. And so you have to have the ATP output from those cells in order to allow for those, for your myosin and actin, well myosin specifically, to have the ATP it needs in order to generate that force. So do we have a way of producing enough energy? And we try to quantify it. So if we know how much oxygen you're consuming, okay, this is gonna be what's known as the VO2. So this is literally, if we're going to sample the air before it goes into your lungs, which is about 20.94%, 20.93% oxygen, and then whatever percentage it is whenever you exhale it, and we know how much volume of air you've had in that period of time, through what's on spirometry, boom, we know how much oxygen you're going to be taking in. And the same situation with carbon dioxide, only the air you breathe in is about 0.03 to 0.04% carbon dioxide, unless you're sucking on diesel fumes, which is not a good call. And then what percent of that air is going to be CO2 and exhale? Usually closer to 4%. We noticed we were in like parts per hundred, and now we're talking about full percentage points. So when we look at this ratio between how much oxygen you're taking in to how much carbon dioxide you're giving out, specifically you take that volume of carbon dioxide, divide it by the volume of oxygen, we get what's known as your respiratory exchange ratio. We care about the respiratory exchange ratio because that tells us what percentage, or essentially, yeah, it gives you an idea of which type of fuel you happen to be utilizing more of. So when your RER equals about 0.7, you're using pretty much 100% or as close as you can to beta oxidation. So you're just using fats as a fuel because you're gonna to have to take in a lot more O2 than you're giving off carbon dioxide just because of the natural amount of oxygen you need in order to break down fuels aerobically per carbon molecule. 
Now, once we have a one-to-one -one ratio of one oxygen in for each CO2 out, that's gonna give us an RER of one, and that's pretty much where we're relying on, on average, aerobic glycolysis. Now, the reason I say on average, guys, is because remember, we're using all those energy systems at the same time. So folded in that average, you probably have some cells that are using anaerobic glycolysis, so they don't have an oxygen demand, but they still are having a buffering capacity, which is gonna actually increase CO2. And then the other side is you still have some cells that are using beta oxidation, because it's not like every single cell in our body switches over to the one energy system. The key is we have the average, so that's, you know, if we take the bell curve, the center, when we have the RER of one, the average is aerobic glycolysis. We're still gonna have a little bit going on to either tails. Does that make sense to you guys? Could you go back over um, how you get the RER? Like what was the formula for that? Yeah, no problems. It's right there, if you can see what I just highlighted, Zach, where it's the total volume of carbon dioxide you're exhaling being divided by the total volume of oxygen you're inhaling. Gotcha, thank you. Hey, no worries, man. Always feel free to ask questions. Is this, when I'm sharing screens, guys, can you see the slides pretty well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, like anything else, I know we're all kind of on our own internet, so I'm not sure how good that is for all you guys at the time. So, what's fascinating, and the reason indirect calorimetry is imperfect is how much CO2 we're producing is not necessarily how much we're exhaling. And the problem with RER is, notice I just brought up fat and carbs you typically metabolize protein at about 0.85 RER. And remember, it's usually a very, very small amount, but it's still there, but you can't really detect it because the vast majority of your energy sources are gonna be fats and carbohydrates. Now, once we get the RER over one, it turns out that's when we're gonna to start to have our body using more anaerobic fuel sources, and specifically glycolysis, and we're going to start to have the accumulation of lactate in the blood, which we're gonna to talk, to talk about in a little bit. And then gluconeogenesis, so that's literally producing new glucose from lactate, glycerol, pyruvate, alanine, that's going to occur at literally an RER of less than 0.7. So we're looking at the average overall. We, we can't really see what's going on individually. I can't give you a perfect breakdown of which cells are using what. The key is to understand it's happening, and unfortunately, we don't have a good way to get at it. Now, we're going to find that all of us have what's known as a resting metabolic rate. So that's just the energy use we have when we're just chilling out, okay? This is how much oxygen we have to consume in order to keep our body moving, and it's going to then be related to how many calories. So notice, guys, at rest, we have an RER of about 0.8, meaning we're using mostly fats as a fuel. This is going to be influenced by your most recent meal. So my um, happy lunch today was a turkey sandwich and eight chocolate covered almonds because I'm on a diet. No, I'm kidding. I just grabbed some extra calories because I went for a little swim to uh, you know scream while I'm underwater for a little bit because I find that to be a really good way for helping me cope with the pandemic. Um, plus then the students don't have to see me screaming. Oh, also crying into the pool because no one can tell you're crying while you're screaming underwater. Hopefully you guys realize that was a joke. Or maybe you cry for, anyways. Now, your going to be typically going through about 0.3 liters of oxygen per minute and resting metabolic rate is around 2,000 calories per day. Now here's the thing with that resting metabolic rate. It's based on how big you are, so weight, how tall you are, your total surface area, and then from there there are going to be some metabolic components to it, meaning when we're looking at your resting metabolic rate, if you're someone that carries a lot more muscle mass, you're gonna probably burn a few more calories per day. If you have a lower bo lean body mass, you're gonna burn a few less. If you happen to have a faster metabolism, so that's gonna be more T3, T4 hormone and otherwise, you're naturally gonna have a higher resting metabolic rate. And then opposite is true if you have a lower resting metabolic rate. Your average person is about that 2,000 kcals. But if we lined up 100 people, that means the guy in the middle, I'm sorry I'm doing it from a gender perspective, but it's just the individual in the middle, it's going to be that one that's about 2,000. Our people with the hummingbird metabolisms might be as high as 2,400, meaning they've got, you can see as much as a 20% flux up or down, but here's the thing. If you're on that 2,000 calories you know, per day and you're somehow, you're that basic average person and you're eating 2,000 calories per day to maintain that body mass, 
Now, if our assumption was incorrect and you're actually that person with that really slow metabolism, so 20% slower, mean you're only burning 1,600 calories. Well, the problem is that actually puts you in a 400 calorie surplus per day. If you do a 400 calorie surplus per day for an entire week, that's gonna net you 2,800 calories. Now, to gain and lose a pound of fat is about 3,500 calories, meaning when we thought we gave you the diet you needed to just maintain your body weight, you're actually eating in excess. So after effectively one week, you'll have almost gain a pound. Well, four fifths of a pound to be exact. And after a full month, now we're talking about you would have gained literally just over three pounds. And then over a year, you would have gained almost 40 pounds, all because of our initial inaccuracies with our formulas. Does that make sense to you guys? Awesome. So, basal metabolic rate is how much energy you're using at rest when you're laying down, you're in a thermoneutral environment, meaning if I asked you guys, are you cold? You'd be like, no, I'm comfortable. Like, this is the temperature that you can hang out in and like be fine. And actually just for fun guys, and I understand a lot of you guys probably choose not to run your AC too high or your heat too high simply because it, it costs money. But like what temperature in a perfect world would you want your apartment to be year round? Just throw that up in the chat. <laughs> Nice. A lot of you, you guys tend to like it cold on average. Cool. Um, uh, that didn't mean to have a pun there. Because you'll find, you know, some folks, I um, lovingly refer to them as lizards on rocks. Um, my mom is one of them. Where in a perfect world, she would prefer that the house is perpetually 78 degrees. Like she just, she loves being in a warm room. That's where she's very comfortable. And yeah, no, that's okay, Jordan. I am definitely not on board with that either. My, my parents, uh, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and it's very normal there for houses to have basements. So like in the summer, my mom is like a lizard basking on the rocks in the living room. And when I was younger, I would just go live in the basement because it turns out it's a lot cooler. And so that's what it means by thermoneutral. Like, where are you comfortable? Like you can just hang out in a t-shirt and shorts or whatever and be be, be comfortable. Now, the other thing is notice guys, after, oh dear God, your Nana's hardcore. Uh, after eight hours of sleep and not having any food for 12 hours. So like what is the total amount of energy that you happen to be actually utilizing? So this then gives us what's known as the minimum energy requirement for living. So what is the bare minimum amount of kcals we need per kilogram of notice fat-free mass per minute? Now, this is, once again, affected by surface area of the body, your age, the total amount of stress you're under. Stress will actually slightly increase your caloric demands, the hormones, the hormonal level that you have, and that total body temperature. Like some of, when they say your body temp, actually go ahead guys, what is the quote unquote average body temperature? What, what do they say is a, is a normal, Ingo, great job Catherine, of that 98.6. Now the reality is, a lot of you guys, if you were to get up first in the morning and take your temperature, it's usually a little bit actually lower when you first get up from sleeping because your body temperature actually drops when you are sleeping. That's why being cold a little bit helps you fall asleep at night or being in a cool enough room that is. But on top of that, some of us have a natural, like just hanging out body temperature of closer to like 99 degrees. Uh, and some of you guys might have a natural hanging out body temperature of like 96 degrees. It's not that one of us is wrong and one of us is right. It's just the natural variability of being human. Just like when we all actually see each other in person, there's obviously some big differences in things like height, weight, you know, bone structure. We all are human, but there's variabilities that you can find from one human to the next. Now, resting metabolic rate is like the BMR. It's gonna be a little bit higher because we're not trying to be so stringent. 
We don't have to have that whole, you've been laying in bed for this period of time. You've slept for eight hours, fasting, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, just give me an idea of what's the caloric rate you typically have when you're hanging out. Also, guys, we probably should abstain from caffeine, be relatively normally hydrated, so on and so forth. Now, notice, guys, now we got a much wider range. And uh, the top end is still probably a little low for some people. And the bottom range is probably a little too high for some people. So on top of that, then we're going to add in three more components, which is we're going to have activity, so exercise, energy expenditure, total, total exercise expenditure, TE. We're going to have a thermic effect of food, and that's going to be literally the calories you use when you're breaking down energy of or digesting food. And then finally, we have what's known as non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So right now, while you guys are watching this, how many of you guys find yourself kind of, you know, tapping your fingers or naturally kind of drumming with your foot, just fidgeting in one way, shape, or another? It sounds odd, but that's actually burning a couple calories per hour. And if you were to fidget more throughout a given day compared to less, at the end of that day, that could net you anywhere from 5, 10, maybe even over 100 extra calories that you're going to burn per day. And that's part of the thing that's really interesting about major weight gain and weight loss is when people are trying to gain weight, they're going to find that non-exercise energy uh, yeah, thermogenesis or activity thermogenesis is going to go up. And the thermic effect of food, because they're eating more calories, is going to go up. And because of that, they can have a real hard time putting on weight because their body is actively trying to work against them, trying to lose it. And the opposite is true. So when you're trying to lose weight, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis goes away. You tend to be a lot more lethargic. You don't move as much. You don't want to do anything. In fact, uh, Cody, how familiar does that sound? If you can unmute yourself. I was, uh, I tried to top it in the chat, my bad. Uh, yeah, it sounds very familiar. So when you were doing your, like the last week before your bodybuilding show, yep. you weren't actually lifting or eating, what was probably the only other thing you really wanted to do, other than eat more? Uh, just lay down. <laughs> just lay down in a hole somewhere. Yeah, pretty much sleeping and not wanting to move. Like, you don't yeah. want to do car uh, cardio, you don't really want to do anything when you're going really hard caloric restriction, and that's because your body's getting you all of those things in opposition fighting against you. And Cody's done a number of uh, shows, I've done a number of stupid diets. If you guys ever want to hear about how horrible it is, please, by all means, stop him or myself, and we'll give you some good context on why it, it can be pretty brutal. Hell, Tom. Hell. Thank you, Cody. Now, as you guys would expect, as our exercise incre intensity increases, so does our metabolic rate. We turn over more calories. We turn over more energy when we're trying to exercise at a, heart, at a higher rate. So... What's this slow component of our oxygen uptake kinetics, which is our VO2, our total amount of oxygen we're going to take in is going to keep increasing as we go up to higher and higher intensities. In fact, it's going to start to kind of shoot away from one another that it's not a perfect correlation at one point because our type 2 fibers, remember guys, are not as good at aerobic metabolism as our type 1 fibers. The other thing that we're going to go ahead and see is what's known as a VO2 drift which is we're going to see an upward drift. So we're going to use more oxygen at sub-maximal power outputs because we're going to actually get better at using oxygen, be able to switch over to utilizing a little more fat as a fuel or use a lot more aerobic metabolism for our energy production as opposed to having to tap into those anaerobic energy systems as much. So when we get to the point where we literally cannot utilize any more oxygen, at, or at a higher rate, we just we're, it just is not able to happen. This was our VO2 max. So this is going to be where our exercise intensity can go up, but our oxygen consumption will not go any higher, and we are peaked out. Like it is, you can't go any faster than that. That was that Wingate test that you guys did, or the, the sprinting on the field that you guys did, or you guys have watched me ride the not so excite bike and kind of curse myself uh, on the YouTubes. That's a great example of working above your aerobic capacity. You just can't maintain that work output no matter how hard you'd like to try because you are literally outrunning your body's ability to do so aerobically. Now, this is a awesome indicator of your aerobic fitness. People with a higher VO2 max are typically a lot more aerobically fit. 
It's pretty straightforward. It's, however, not the best indicator of endurance performance because endurance performance is not just your VO2 max. It's also where is your lactate threshold along with what is your efficiency in the movement and a couple other lesser components from there. But those are the kind of the big rocks. Now, if you're really training someone hard for aerobic fitness, you're really going to see this performance plateauing after only about eight to 12 weeks. Now, our performance is still going to go up because we're going to become more efficient as a runner, a swimmer, a biker, a skater, whatever method you want to use. And we're going to be able to increase our lactate threshold. So we're going to be able to maintain our performance at a much higher percentage of our VO2 max. Because the key is, at your VO2 max, you can probably only maintain that performance for, oh, I would say, less than, yeah, you'd be you'd be really hardcore to be able to hold on to your VO2 max for less than 10 minutes. Like it's, it's really uncomfortable to be there because you're already going to overshot your lactate threshold, which is a real big component that we're going to touch on in a few moments. So we still want a good idea for this. Uh, college age males are going to typically be like 45 to 50, depending on how good aerobic fitness they are. That's why you guys are going to be doing the, uh, submax uh, VO2 lab, which will be coming up later. And also, before I forget, the lab on Friday, we're going to be doing our jumping lab. So you guys are going to actually come into the lab at some point from now until then. The just jump mat is going to be sitting out in the lab. You literally get on the mat and you just jump. Now you're going to do three different types of jump. One of those jumps is going to be a counter movement, which is your typical Go down, go up, jump as high as you can. The next one is gonna be you're gonna sit down into the bottom of the jump and you're gonna wait for someone to tell you to jump and then you're gonna jump as high as you can. That's what's known as the static jump. So you're trying to get rid of that stretch reflex. And the third jump is a step approach. So the goal is I want you to think step up and then jump as high as you can. So it'd be like if you're trying to do a layup in basketball or you're going up to spike in volleyball, you're trying to use effectively that movement into it, which is gonna help a little bit with the elastic essentially components and it's going to help you jump a little bit higher and the nice thing is when using the just jump mat you don't have to take your reach height and you don't have to do the math to figure out how far you reached up and, and jumped and that's if you had to use the vertex with the just jump mat you literally just jump and then you look at it and it'll give you the number and tell you how high you jumped and it's going to be in inches is what you're going to initially get that data so vo2 max is going to be in liters per minute which is nice in that it just shows you the true aerobic battery in an absolute sense. But what we really care about with an, athlete's, with an athlete is then going to be what's known as normalized for body weight, which is we take that same milliliters of oxygen per minute, but we also are gonna divide it by your body mass. Because here's the thing, if we're gonna just look at the total amount of oxygen that someone can use, mine is probably higher than nearly every single athlete on the cross country team, especially the females. Why? Because I weigh over 200 pounds, and I think their biggest kid right now doesn't even weigh a buck 50. So the way that they are great athletes is because it's the amount of oxygen they can use relative to their body size. That's what really matters for aerobic athletes. And yes, you typically see that women's VO2 max is going to be a little bit lower than your average guys, usually somewhere in the neck of 10%. And that's going to be typically just due to differences in fat-free mass, sometimes hemoglobin, because women are on a monthly phlebotomy schedule. Um, you guys know what I mean when I say that, right? Okay, good. Catherine does, and I'm sure all the ladies do. The guys that don't, women have a menstrual cycle, so they always lose a little bit of blood each week or each month, each week. Jeez, that would be, that'd be really bad. Uh, I feel bad for that lady in that cycle. So, but we're still, we're only looking at those performances relative to that individual and then our goals given the sport that they're trying to compete in. Now, when we're talking about our highest performance aerobically, we can go faster than that. That's what a true 100 meter sprint is. That's what 400 meter sprint is because you're going to be utilizing both aerobic systems and anaerobic systems. Now, what we're going to look at when we're trying to figure out how much anaerobic you're using well, we can look at how much oxygen you're going to consume after you get done with that bout. And this is what's known as EPOC, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Meaning when you finish doing that sprint or, any, or something along those lines, how long are you breathing hard after it? 
Um, and not necessarily sprinting. This can be doing high rep squatting, uh, deadlifting, anything along those lines where like afterwards you're like, oh man, like I need a few minutes to get my breath back because I am cooked. That is absolutely normal. Now, the lactate threshold is the point at which if we were taking blood values, we would see the point at which your blood lactate would start to really increase inside of, or the concentration inside of your actual blood. Now, what does this mean? Well, remember we utilize anaerobic energy systems in those muscle fibers that don't get enough oxygen to keep up the work output they need to do. That lactate is then going to be shipped to the slow twitch fibers right next to it, and they'll use that as fuel. Now, once they're no longer using that as a fuel enough, it's gonna go into the bloodstream. When it goes into your bloodstream, all the slow twitch fibers throughout the rest of your body can use it as fuel, your brain can use it as a fuel, and your heart can use it as a fuel. The problem is, you get to a point where those type two fibers are producing lactate at such a rate that all of those tissues in the body can't use it as fast as it's accumulating. So think of your blood lactate levels as being two parts. You have how quickly you clear it, so that'd be like the drain, and then how quickly you add it into the tub. So that's gonna be your production. Everyone has a finite drain size, meaning we can only drop out so much so quickly. So think about your bathtub. If I'm to turn the faucet on, and I can turn the faucet on probably on the highest level, and there's just gonna be a little bit of water in the tub. Think of that as the lactate, because it's just gonna be going straight through the drain and it's going to just empty at the rate of which it's being poured in, hence why it doesn't accumulate. Lactate threshold would be the equivalent of, not only we have the faucet on a full blast, but then I walk in there with the fire hose and start to open up the fire hose. And eventually, the fire hose and the faucet are gonna be going fast enough, the production, that it can't drain out of it as fast as it's being added in. And that's where you see your lactate levels rise because it's filling. Does that make sense to you guys? Now here's the problem. And you guys probably lived this a little bit when you were doing that Wingate. And like, if you guys want other brutal ways you can accumulate lactate, trust me, I can give them to you. How does it really feel whenever you're having that lactate accumulating in your blood? How does it feel? Kind of like numb a little bit or like really feels like weights are in you. You feel sluggish. You'll feel some probably burning inside of your muscles and inside of your lungs. Yeah, it's not a great time. So once that lactate starts to accumulate, you're on borrowed time for how long you can keep up that output before you're just gonna fatigue out, irregardless of how hard you wanna work. You're just not able to keep up that amount of work. So now the post-exercise oxygen consumption, guys, is literally, you see that graph on the right, of when you first start exercising, you're not actually taking in enough oxygen to maintain that work output. And even then you can still work out at, at an exercise intensity that's way higher than you can maintain. And then it's how long does it take you to get your breath back? Usually this is going to be effectively, hopefully you get it resolved in a couple minutes. There'll be some yahoos on the internet that'll tell you like, oh yeah, your epoch is up for three hours after this workout. I'm like, if I'm still breathing hard three hours after the workout, I probably need to go to the hospital. Like there's something wrong. But think about the most brutal, like hard thing you guys did metabolically. Um, you know, like I said, could be running a 400 meter, running an 800 meter, uh, doing just some maximally hard sprinting conditioning work. And yeah, you maybe were on the ground, on your back, like praying that you didn't have to vomit because you didn't know if you had the, the energy in you to flip over on your stomach. But even when you felt that bad, 10 minutes later, were you pretty much back to normal? Exactly. Now, why that is, is because, well, we're recovering all our ATP and phosphocreatine levels. We're going to be converting that lactate back into glucose and then maybe back into glycogen or wherever it needs to go in the body. We're going to be getting our hemoglobin and myoglobin re-oxygenated, and we're going to get rid of all that excess carbon dioxide. So it's completely normal for your breathing to be really elevated at the end of hard training but it's something that we should be able to recover in 10 minutes or less. And that in fact, it's really important because we can go ahead and look at how quickly you come back to normal as an indicator of your fitness 
along with doing an active recovery, meaning like a low intensity jog or a walk or something like that after hard training is going to help us clear that lactate a little bit faster. So there's no perfect like VO2 max equivalent for really testing anaerobic capacity, but we've got a number of different ways we can get at it as far as doing the Wingate. And then there's another video online of a critical power test. I'm not going to make you guys do it just because of limitations we have with equipment. Uh, I mean, we can maybe open it up if we got some folks that really want to go for it. But really what that is, is it's a Wingate only with half the resistance and six times the duration. So you do three minutes against a pretty hard resistance trying to keep up the highest work output you can because the basic idea is you're going to exhaust your ability to exercise anaerobic like politically and then all you're going to be left with is just that leftover however much power output you have and so you're going to be pretty floored. So now another big component for our ability to perform is once again that economy of effort. So if both of us have the same VO2 max, whichever athlete can do that movement more efficiently, they are going to use less energy at the same given intensity. So they're actually gonna be able to go a little bit faster compared to the other person, okay? The more we do any activity, as long as we're being mindful of it, we should be getting more efficient with it. Now, herein lies the wonderful thing, or a good example of it. How many of you guys have gone swimming recently or have ever you know, tried to go swimming and you can see that some folks, they are super fast and smooth in the water and it seems like they're putting in no energy because they are really efficient as a swimmer. And then other folks, they're maybe in really good shape and they're really conditioned, but like, dear God, like they're working really hard to go nearly nowhere. That's going down to the economy of effort, which is obvious with inexperienced swimmers to experienced swimmers, but you don't really see it as much with people running because you know, how often you really watch people running. But if you really see a high level long distance athlete compared to someone who's just getting into jogging, you can see those differences in technique and who's using more energy compared to the other to do the same exercise. Does that make sense to you guys? Awesome. And that's why, you know, when I'm feeling kind of, I don't know, being a bit of a jerk, I guess, I like the idea of challenging the uh, cross country kids to a mile run, but you know, we're going to do it while dragging a 200 pound sled. Uh, you know, for me, it'll just be kind of another day. For some of them, it'll be apocalyptic because they're not used to doing it and they're not conditioned in that type of way. So they're probably gonna struggle. Plus they're way, way lighter. So if you really wanna be a really high level aerobic athlete, well, it turns out we wanna have that really high VO2 max. Then we want to go ahead and have a very high lactate threshold. So we're going to be able to maintain that high percentage of VO2 max without really hitting fatigue. We want to be really economical with our movement. We want to be able to really use the stretch reflex, use the elastic component of the muscles as much as possible. And we want to have a really high amount of type one muscle fiber just because that kind of lends itself to this performance. Now remember type two A fibers can start to take on a lot more of the basics of type two fibers where we can increase their amount of mitochondria, increase the amount of capillaries to them, which is gonna definitely help performance and allow you to keep up that workout put for much longer. Now, on the right is just giving you an idea of how much energy expenditure you're gonna have given different physical activities. And you can obviously see as we're going up at exercise intensity, so specifically if you look at the uh, running, and then, you know, swimming itself is also very metabolically costly. Now, these are estimations. It's never perfect because it all depends on, obviously, you know, what you're doing with it and how hard the work really is. But you can have some pretty massive caloric demands from a lot of different activities. It's once again, going to come down to how hard are you pushing yourself. So the next thing we need to really understand is fatigue. And so fatigue effectively has those two separate definitions. So... One is going to be just a decline in performance, even with us trying to keep up our effort and along with not feeling too energetic. The second is just a simple you know, math problem. We cannot maintain the power output to continue that work at that given intensity, flat out. And the first one is how do you feel about it? The second one is just the cut and dry, sad reality of it. Now, both have their times and a place, but if anything, focus more on the second one which is 
just making a math problem. Why are we not able to keep up that power output? Is it because we're inefficient, which is an easy thing to fix. We can just help improve technique. Is it because we don't have the aerobic capacity to do it, which is a long, hard performance increaser that's going to take time. It could also be a metabolic in that if we're using those energy systems, if we don't have enough glycogen in our cells, we're not going to be able to utilize aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis because we don't have a fuel source. So it's literally, okay, we just need to get more fuel in them. Now, reversible by rest, this means literally we stop, give you a break, and then you can recover. And we're going to have high intensity fatigue and long uh, duration or high duration, high volume fatigue. So it's complex because it's going to come down to the different types of fatigue, the intensity of our exercise, the fiber types we're using, how well trained we are in that diet. So we look at our four major causes. One is just straight up, we are not producing energy at a fast enough rate. So this can be because we have issues with not having enough mitochondria in the cell, the enzymes related to the energy systems, not a big enough phosphocreatine stores, not high enough amount of glycogens or glycogen. We could have an issue where it's the accumulation of all those metabolic byproducts. Once we have enough lactate, we're also getting the protons that come with it. Lactate's a fuel source, it's absolutely fine. Protons, however, are gonna cause us to decrease our pH, which is gonna cause enzymes to start shutting down and we're not gonna be able to keep it up. And then eventually, we're literally not gonna be able to get our muscles to contract because those enzymes are not working like they're supposed to. And then our own nervous system is gonna tell us, hey, calm down, man, you can hurt us if you keep going at these rates. And so it's gonna naturally shut us down. And that's gonna be known as what's more of the central governor theory. So we're going to dive into the energy systems and specifically the phosphocreatine initially next week. You guys know what you need to do and you know where the lab is as far as coming and doing the Just Jump mat. Make sure if you're in here, guys, you're going to be wearing the mask. We're going to keep the Just Jump mat on the force plate that's in the lab. You can see the little video on YouTube that I shot of doing the lab by myself. So you can either just copy those numbers for your lab. And I think when I shot that, I probably weighed like 212, 213, just ballpark it. And I'm uh, five foot 10 on a really good day. So call it five nine. And otherwise, you guys can come in and do those jumps yourself. And then we're going to talk through them on Friday on the backside of the wonderful old rec center and come up with some numbers that we come up with. So questions, comments, concerns. How long is the lab open? Like time. Um, yes, so the lab is probably gonna be open today until a little after five. And then on Thursday, it's gonna be open from essentially nine until, oh, I teach night school, so it's gonna be open until probably nine to seven or so, but it's gonna be open, meaning we're not going to be necessarily able to really help you guys out and walk you through it. You're going to be on your own to a certain extent, but the, the machine is really, really simple to use. And you can see the YouTube video of me running. Um, and then Friday, it's going to be open from sometime in the morning until effectively you guys are going to have class. Please, 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 guys, don't everybody dogpile coming into the lab on Friday. Um, we're going to figure if you haven't done the lab by noon on Friday, then you're in trouble with me and you didn't get it done. You'll just have to use the video. So um, with that being said, guys, if I were you right now in the chat, go ahead and throw up like what time that you'd like to go ahead and do it. You know, see who wants to try to do it today. See who wants to try to do it tomorrow. And then you guys can go ahead and uh, yeah, figure out what time's going to work for you and, you know, just one or two other people. So that way you guys can do it together and help record data for one another because you only have to do nine total jumps warm up a little bit beforehand and give it your best effort on each of them because remember it's the counter movement down up jump as high as you can it's the statics you're going to hold the bottom wait until your partner says go and then you're going to jump as high as you can and then it's going to be the step approach jump so make sure that you guys figure out what's going to work for a couple of you guys and then you'll be good to go so yeah just keep throwing thank you jordan for putting something else out there see if anybody else wants to hop in and uh yeah